right, we're going to go ahead and get started now. Thank you again, everybody, for joining today. Really excited to have you here. Um, thanks for joining our session today on, on Embodied Carbon. It's an introductory webinar that's going to show us how buildings can be used as a climate solution instead of an obstacle on our path to carbon neutrality. I'm super excited to introduce our two guest speakers for today's session, who are not only experts in their own fields, but have been making waves across the green building community on sponsoring new uh, green building codes that can prove that carbon neutral, carbon neutral construction is possible. Bruce King is the author of the new Carbon Architecture and has been a structural engineer for 42 years, designing buildings of every size and type all over the world. He's also an author of the ASTM Standard for Earth and Construction, the Marin County Low Carbon Concrete Code, and the books Building of Earth and Straw, Making Better Concrete, and Design of Straw Bale Buildings. Mr. King is also the founder and director of the Ecological Building Network, a nonprofit information resource that sponsors the Build Well Source, an online library of low carbon and carbon storing materials. Chris Magwood, who is our second speaker for today, is currently the executive director of the Endeavor Center, a non-for-profit sustainable building school in Peterborough, Ontario. In 2019, he helped to establish Builders for Climate Action, which will be rolling out a set of tools and policy options to help governments, designers, and builders reverse climate change with their buildings. He has authored seven books on sustainable construction, including Essential Sustainable Home Design, is co-editor of the Sustainable Building Essential series from New Society Publishers, and, it con and has contributed to the book, The New Carbon Architecture. In 1998, he co-founded Camel's Fat Construction and over eight years helped to design and build more than 30 homes and commercial buildings, mostly, mostly with straw bales and often with renewable energy systems. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Again, if you could remember to mute your lines during the presentation, that would be fantastic. Note that this session does qualify for continuing education credits on USGBC. Instructions can be found on the screen. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please go ahead and type them in the chat. I will be reviewing and making note of them for a Q&A session at the end. And finally, this session will be recorded and posted on TKN's sustainability website. You can also find previous recordings from our Green Construction and Resiliency webinar series there as well. Now, without further ado, please welcome Mr. King, who's gonna start us off today. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. So yeah, we wanna say a little bit about embodied carbon and not just getting to carbon neutrality, but doing a whole lot better and getting beyond zero. Let me draw an analogy. Some of you have seen the movie Apollo 13. Uh, gosh, came out 15 years ago or more, uh, based on the true story of the moon mission that went wrong. They were on their way to the moon and discovered on their way out that they had been bleeding oxygen into space and would not have enough air to keep the astronauts alive. They had to go right out to the moon, swing around, and come back to Earth, which they did. But then on the way back to Earth, they realized they had another problem. The atmosphere inside the capsule was getting more and more poisonous because of the CO2, the carbon dioxide that the astronauts were exhaling. CO2, if it builds up enough, is toxic. It will kill you. So there came this scene in the movie, I call the geek's finest hour, when all the engineers came together in a room and the mission commander said, hold out a box of stuff and said, this is what they have in the capsule. Design a carbon dioxide filter with this and tell them how to make it in the next three hours, which they did. The interesting part was the astronauts not only had to do it, but they had to do it with highly impaired mental capacity because the CO2 poisoning will slow you down, put you to sleep and you're just dumber. They pulled it all off. It's a cool movie and it's a true story. Anybody see a metaphor there? This is our atmosphere. If you scraped it off on the from the surface of the earth into one big ball, it would be about this big. If you took, say, for example, New York City and you drew a line from Battery Park up to the middle of Central Park, that's about the distance is the thickness of the atmosphere that you and I can breathe. Spread that all around the world and it's far, far thinner than an eggshell. There's not very much. We see these images all the time of an astronaut floating in space and it looks so, so lonely and so vulnerable. And yet that big blue sphere underneath him is not a whole lot less so. We've been mucking with it and we have to figure out what to do now. For the last half million years or so that our species has been evolving on Earth, CO2 levels in the, in the 
atmosphere have been banging back and forth between 200 and 300 parts per million. I think you all probably already know this. And since the Industrial Revolution, we're burning fossil fuels. And it shot up past 400 now. I think it's last I saw was 415. Here's the thing is, even if we could stop tomorrow on a dime burning fossil fuels, they would still, the, the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases would still keep going up. We've set something in motion. The methane released in the Arctic, the reduced albedo at the poles, et cetera, it would still get worse. What we have to do is get it back out of the atmosphere. We have to draw it down. And I specifically use this word to reference Paul Hawkins' uh, seminal book called Drawdown that I highly recommend. If you haven't read it, look it up. It's great. The 100 Easiest Solutions for Humanity to Reverse Climate Disruption. A very fun read, a good read, and well done. Well, where can we put the carbon? If we get it out of the air, great. Where do we put it? Right now, the default is the oceans. They're doing the work right now. They are absorbing carbon out of the atmosphere very quickly. Thank you, oceans, but it's not actually working out so well because it acidifies. It changes the pH level. That's what's dissolving coral reefs. It's changing everything in every ocean ecosystem. So not a great solution. We could put it back in the soil. And a lot of people are working on that. And in fact, that's a great place to put it. We spent the last 200 years essentially decarbonizing the soil with industrial agriculture. So we're working on reversing that too. That's a whole nother talk though. It relates to what Chris and I will talk about today, but it's not our focus. Buildings are our focus. The built environment, buildings and infrastructure, everything else uses far, far more physical stuff than any other industry. So this is a place where we can naturally put a lot of carbon and we're building a lot. The equivalent of another New York City every month is what we're building right now. Every month, the equivalent of a whole nother all five boroughs New York City, which might seem incredible to you where you're sitting because you don't see it. None of us see it in North America, it's not here. It's in Cairo, it's in Sao Paulo, it's in Hangzhou. It's in, mostly in the Southern Hemisphere, mostly China and India, and soon to be Africa and South America. And they don't build with the stuff that we tend to build with here. Some basics on buildings and greenhouse gases. About 40% of humanity's uh, emissions into the world come from buildings in one way or another. Any building project, any building in its lifetime has two basic phases. You build it, and then that's where the embodied or the so-called upfront emissions are, the materials, the trucks roaring around, all of that. And then there's the operating emissions. When you move in and everybody starts using it and you run the heater, you run the lights, you run the Wi-Fi, you run the air conditioner, all of that. And over the lifetime of most buildings, the operating emissions will dwarf the embodied emissions. And that's been the understanding of green building for these past 30 years. So we focused on reducing operating emissions and get things down to much, much more efficient or even net zero. That's all great, and we've made a lot of progress in that. But we were missing something. What we were missing was a sense of scale and a sense of how time value matters. We we're actually worried about just the next couple decades, the next generation. And when you look at it from that perspective, it becomes quite a different picture. 12% of Humanity's emissions are, can be attributed to embodied emissions, basically to the materials we use. Some people say 11, some people say higher. So we could argue that number, but I call it 12. About an eighth of all the emissions we put up there are from making building materials. And they have a much higher value than those operating emissions because they go up in the air right away. They're cooking away from, by the time you're moving into the building, those things are up there cooking because it's the area to the right of the line. It's not the height of the line, it's the area to the right. And when you look at that, you realize, whoa, that's what matters. And this is the one big takeaway that I hope you can get from this is anything you build this year, three fourths of your climate impact for the next 20 years, these crucial next 20, 30 years are gonna be from the embodied emissions from the materials that you use in your project. So what can we do about that? Well, for the 30 years or more that I've been banging around in the green building world, this is the orthodoxy. Let's make really great buildings. Let's make lead platinum buildings, living future, net zero buildings, passive house. And yes, reduce the embodied emissions, you know, the cement and the steel, yeah. And oh yeah, we should upgrade our existing buildings. And this is what generally the architecture community and the construction community have understood for a long time now. And it's backwards. It's exactly backwards. 
the greatest thing we can do for the climate is not tear down any buildings now, unless they're completely trashed. If there's a decent enclosure and structure there, keep it. Upgrade the buildings we've got all over the world, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, so that they're not bleeding energy into the sky every moment of every day. And then reduce the embodied emissions of the new stuff we build and the retrofits we do and make all the new buildings we then build net zero, make them properly. Another analogy, where I live, just like where you live, there's probably little puddle jumper flights that you could take between little cities, San Francisco and Sacramento. It's about a two hour drive from downtown San Francisco to downtown Sacramento, but people will take a short hop flight if they're in a hurry or for all the reasons people would do that. But if you went to San Francisco airport to catch the 1020 to Sacramento, you don't expect to see a 747 pull up at the gate. It would be ridiculous. There's just 12 of you there gonna get on a little prop plane probably and go. That's all you need. You don't need a 747. And yet that's exactly what we do in construction. We use a 747 for everything, especially with concrete, but all over the place. We overdo things. And yeah, it's because the engineers, I'm guilty. It's because of the insurance companies, it's because of the building codes, but still has to change. Concrete's the big one. Of all the embodied emissions foci, places to look, concrete is really the big one, both because it's 8% of global emissions and it's relatively easy nowadays to reduce the footprint of concrete, and I'll get into that. We make 10 billion tons of concrete every year. That's how much the world produces and places in one way or another on highways, buildings, everything. I got to wondering how much is 10 billion tons of concrete? Sounds like a lot, you just go, oh yeah, that's a lot. Well, how much is one ton of concrete? Well, if you took one ton of concrete, you'd get a desk, about 29 inch cube. 10 billion tons of concrete makes a cube that's a mile on a side. It's five times the height of the Eiffel Tower. Pound for pound, concrete is a very low carbon material, but if you make 10 billion pounds of anything, you're going to have an effect. Similar story with asphalt, what we use to make our highways. And we use so much of it, it'd be a cube about 1,200 feet on a site, as I recall, every year of asphalt that we're making highways and things. We've now paved over the world between our buildings and our parking lots and our highways, an area the size of Texas. How do you make low carbon concrete? How do you reduce the footprint? Well, it's mostly about the cement. Concrete is sand and gravel and glue put together and then put into place, sprayed or poured or whatever. That's concrete, sand and gravel and glue. The glue we use is Portland cement most of the time, and that's made by baking limestone at 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, so one of the things you can do is get more energy efficiency in your cement plants, and they've been working on that for decades now. You can't get a whole lot more efficiency out of the plants they have. You can use alternative fuels. Instead of fossil fuels, you can burn municipal waste or tires, but all of that presents certain problems too. You can use blended cements. It basically means you intermix the basic Portland cement that you made by baking the limestone and grind in with other things, uh, fly ash and pozzolans or ground up limestone. And you can get just as good concrete without all the carbon footprint. The big promising one for us is carbon capture and storage, where we take carbon in one form or another and inject it into the concrete. And I'll say more about that. And there's also new cements coming along. We're within sight, we're within a generation of actually having concrete that instead of making 8% of global emissions is storing a ton of carbon for every ton of concrete that you pour. It could be a net absorber and probably the biggest one we've got. Although Chris is gonna show you some good stuff we can do with plants too. These are all the cements we have. Take a screen capture if you wanna look at this later. This will be in the book that Chris and I are writing, little plug here uh, that we'll have out in about a year. Um, there's all sorts of different things we can use for cements besides Portland cement, but none of them at any great volume. We just don't have enough fly ash and slag and other things. Our biggest, pro most promising things are limestone and clay. I have to leave that at that. How do you make low carbon concrete? Well. You see things called pozzolans, you may have heard of that. Supplementary cementitious materials. Most ready mix suppliers in most urban areas now have them or can get them. Extend the time, talk to your engineer. Engineers are so habituated, the whole industry is habituated, the codes are habituated to identifying concrete by its 28 day strength. 
when very often you don't need to have strength before three or six or 12 months. If you give it more time, you can lower the cement content and reduce the footprint. Blended cements, as I talked about, you can inject carbon, liquid carbon, carbon cure, some of you have heard of. Blue Planet is building their plant right now. Here in the Bay Area, we're making artificial limestone out of the emissions from a natural gas power plant right next door. That's how carbon cure works, is it augments the strength so you don't need as much cement. Reduce your waste, use your returned concrete. This may be the biggest one, it's just talking to people. Talk to your engineer. If you're an engineer, talk to your builder. All sorts of cool things happen when you just communicate, which we're not so much accustomed to doing in this industry. Everybody just stays in their silo and does what they gotta do and does what they're told. Yeah. This building here is a California Public Utilities Commission building downtown San Francisco and the engineer David Marr was working on it and he started thinking about the structural system and he ended up calling the concrete supplier and the ready mix supplier, the concrete, the main contractor, the general contractor and the ready mix guy. And they sat around in a room for a day and out of that they came up with a better structural system that reduced the floor to floor height so much that they could get an entire another floor into the building and reduce its carbon footprint by 40%. By talking. Here in California, we tried out uh, a low carbon concrete building code here in Marin County where I live, and now it's uh, expanding to other places. Um, New York is looking at stuff, New York City and New York State, uh, state of, a lot of places are now looking at addressing embodied emissions through policy and building code. Uh, ASHRAE is looking at it now. So this stuff is coming. It's not easy to write code, but it's coming. Now, other things besides concrete, the other big one is steel. Between cement and steel, that's the big, big, big lion's share of all the embodied emissions of buildings. And steel is a big one, but there's not a lot of wiggle room there. The steel people already recycle everything a lot. Their only way to improve is to get to um, a hydrogen-based steel economy. And that's a whole nother story that I can't get into here. But here's an interesting one, comes, comes out of Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown. I'm having a, power, a failure with my system here. There we go. Refrigerants are a huge part of climate change. The chemicals, hydrofluorocarbons, that are the liquids that you put into an air conditioner, like you see at the back of that building there, or in the heat pumps that we put in buildings, and also to blow the gases into uh, rigid foam insulation. Those things, are chosen because they have a very high specific heat. They work really well for these purposes, but they have a very high global warming potential, thousands of times more than carbon dioxide. And every strip mall and every convenience store everywhere in the world has one of those air conditioners there hanging on the back and eventually leaking, dripping away and having a huge effect on the climate. And by the way, that New York City being built every month right now, mostly it's right now, it's here in China. This is residential construction in China. And it's just a big concrete shell. Not a lot of insulation, if any. You move into this place, you moved in from the countryside and you got your apartment in Beijing and hopefully you have power and water. And if you have power, you buy yourself a window air conditioning unit and put it in and there you go. It's a big upgrade for your lifestyle in many ways, but it's a disaster for the climate. So where's the drawdown? How do we get it back out of the air? More broadly, one of the things you see a lot of is you hear about carbon capture and storage. You see these giant machines that are standing out in the wind or glued onto the smokestack of a power plant and sucking, filtering out the carbon dioxide. And sometimes you people will think, oh ho, don't these rubes don't know, they know about trees and straw who do this all the time for free with solar power. Ha ha, let's let them do that. Well, they do that and it's cool what they do and we're, only starting to unpack how we can build with what they provide us. Chris is gonna tell you a bunch about that in just a moment. But we also need the machines on the smokestacks because what they do, trees don't do, which is a deliverous carbon dioxide gas, which we can then use in a new regenerative, sustainable e industrial ecosystem and turn it into concrete or food or clothing or all sorts of things, utilizing the carbon that we pull back out of the air and putting it into buildings and everything else. I'm gonna hand off to Chris now, but 
leave you with this slide. There's our cube of concrete again, a mile on a side next to the Eiffel Tower. If you took all the straw that we harvest in the world, just from growing our food, it's 2 billion tons of straw. If you packed it all into the same density as a straw bale, you'd get a cube a mile and three quarters on a side. Just the carbon there in that straw produced annually would be enough if turned into durable building materials to negate all the emissions from the cement. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Chris. And Chris, you'll just have to tell me when to hit the button. Sure, okay, thanks Bruce and, and hi everybody. And, and Bruce, thanks for uh, such a great setup. Um, I am really keen to, to sort of talk about, about what a plant-based building uh, system might look like. And I first want to sort of address what, what ends up uh, being the, um, the sort of elephant in the room uh, when we talk about carbon storing building materials. And that is how, how we think about that, that carbon storage and what it means uh, over the lifespan of a plant-based building product. And what we tend to do right now, uh, and it's a good thing that, that we're doing this, but we look at uh, a life cycle assessment comparison of these materials. And a, a sort of typical static life cycle assessment kind of adds up all the emissions associated with every product that might go into a building uh, from when you first harvest the raw materials to the end of the life of the building. And what we tend to do is look at that answer, how, how much emissions was associated with material one. So in this graph, that's shown as a, as a red circle and with material two, it's a green circle. Um, those two results look fairly similar at the end of their life. And that's, that's how we tend to right now compare uh, non-biogenic materials, non-plant-based materials with, uh, with plant-based materials. But if we go to the next slide, what I wanna do is sort of trace you the path uh, of how we get to those two endpoints and show you how different it is. So if you want to, so here, when you first put a plant in the ground, whether it's a tree uh, or an agricultural uh, uh, crop, there's usually a small burst of emissions. So that, that first little upward um, movement there is some emissions that go into the atmosphere from planting. But then over the whole course of that plant growing, and that, that timeline it, you know, can change quite a bit. If, it's, if we're talking a, a northern species tree, that might be 60 to 100 years. If we're talking about um, a piece of wheat straw, that might be two or three months. But over the course of it growing, it's pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And then we harvest, manufacture, transport, and build the building. And we will add emissions back into the atmosphere uh, through all of those processes. But for most of the plant-based building materials uh, that we know of now, the, the volume of those emissions that go back into the atmosphere is quite a bit smaller than the amount that the plant drew out of the atmosphere in the first place. So then that big thick green line that's the amount of carbon that has been sort of net stored in that building material for the lifespan of that building. Now, when you get to the end of the life, um, there's a whole bunch of different scenarios and life cycle assessment doesn't do a great job of exploring many of these. So if you're able to reuse that carbon, then it continues to be stored. If you recycle it, it can continue to be stored. If you turn it into biochar, it can continue to be stored. Uh, if you burn it to make combined heat and power, you don't necessarily store it, but you, you replace fossil fuels with it. So really the only scenario where we end up with a lot of emissions at the end of life is if it goes to a landfill and turns into methane. Um, and that's what the, uh, the end of life scenario tends to capture in life cycle assessment. But if we look at the pathway of a non-biogenic material, what we see is that every single stage in the life cycle is adding emissions. And as Bruce pointed out at the start of the talk, that burst at the start, that bunch of um, emissions from the construction phase, so from harvesting, manufacturing, transporting, and constructing, all of that goes in the atmosphere prior to the building being occupied. And so for the entire lifespan of that building, those emissions are in the atmosphere and driving more climate change. 
So the difference between that red line and the green line down below, that's the, the impact that building with carbon storing materials makes. So even if they end up similar in, in certain scenarios at the end of their lifespan, over the, the, the duration of a building's lifespan, which typically goes you know, beyond the point at which we're either going to have fixed climate change or be in a, in a real deep climate crisis, we've made that significant difference between making meaningful carbon storage and putting more emissions into the atmosphere. So that's, that's sort of what the, um, what the profile of these materials look like. So when we say that these are carbon storing materials, that's, that's the scenario that we're, we're sort of talking about. And so I'm a, I'm a builder by trade. And, uh, and so, you know, for me, I'm really interested in what, you know, what are the materials that I can use to be able to uh, store carbon in a building. And there's all, quite a few of them. Some of them I'm gonna show you are the ones that are out there today. So we'll start with those. Uh, the first of which is cellulose, which we know as, a, as, a, as an insulation material, comes in um, bat form, loose fill form, and for larger buildings in particular, uh, spray applied for ceilings and exterior walls and retrofits. So including some really big applications like sports stadium roofs and uh, the undersides of parking lots and, and all kinds of places like that. And the, the, the uh, recycled newsprint and quite often now cardboard because there's more available cardboard thanks to Amazon and packaging than there is newsprint in the world. Um, we're basically taking that material that was destined for the landfill or destined for incineration and putting it into a building for many decades and so that's where we're getting the carbon storage from, from that material. Okay. Another available material today is wood fiber. And again, it comes in uh, many different forms uh, as uh, loose fill, as bat insulation, but for large buildings in particular, the rigid board form is, uh, is a really great option for carbon storage. You can see uh, there on the left, in Germany in particular, a lot of very large buildings are being, uh, their energy efficiency retrofits are being done by cladding the building, over cladding the building with, um, with rigid wood fiber boards. It's also starting to happen more here in North America, although right now more at the, at the residential level. Uh, but this is another great way to take uh, wood waste and mill residues and turn it into carbon storing building materials. Other ones, and, and you know, I'm just giving you a little snapshot, but um, Rewall is a product for uh, roof and wall sheathing that's being made in California out of recycled drinking boxes. Um, Nexem and Fastwall uh, insulated concrete form blocks are made from waste wood chips in cement. And uh, Nexem is now making theirs with cork insulation inserts. And you can see there on the right, some very large buildings have, have been made out of that material. And this is just a, a snapshot. There, there are there are more, but you know, if you if you sort of look at a building project, there's a really good chance that whether it's in a, a structural form um, or a sheathing form or an insulation form, there are biogenic options that that you know act as one-to-one -one replacements for uh, things that we're currently building with right now. Okay. What I mostly want to focus on here, though, is some of the biogenic carbon storing materials that are kind of in development right now, and in particular sort of uh, starting to get used in, in Europe more than here in North America, um, but where the, 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 these types of materials are starting to be developed into systems that are, are becoming more and more appropriate for, for large buildings. And mostly here we're talking about things made from agricultural residues. So the, the big cube that Bruce showed next to the, the concrete block, these are, these are materials that are, are byproducts of the food we grow. So we grow these plants, we eat a portion of them, but there's a, a large portion, usually the stock left over. And because we plant these plants on an annual basis, there's a, a very large, uh, as Bruce pointed out, with, with just with grain straw, 2 billion tons a year of this material being generated if we can capture that and put it in buildings and prevent it from going to the atmosphere, there are these huge potentials for, for carbon storage in our buildings. 
So I'm just gonna show you now some examples of larger buildings that are using these. So this is uh, the Louis Michel School in France made from prefabricated straw bale panels um, and quite a, quite a large building. It was built, I think in 2013. So it's been uh, up for quite a while now, monitored for a long time um, and has sort of met all the performance requirements for uh, public assembly buildings in France. We can move on. This is the Darumli uh, Sports Hall in the Netherlands. And this is actually a retrofit. And so they wanted to make the building more energy efficient. And they actually chose a blown in straw uh, exterior insulation wrap for this building. So again, this is one of the, the largest um, buildings that, that straw insulation has been used uh, as a retrofit material. We can move to the next one. This is the Inspire Bradford Business Park in UK. Uh, again, this one made from prefabricated straw bale panels, in this case, the mod cell system um, that's made in England. This is the Marks and Spencer store in Cheshire Oaks in the UK. And this one was uh, enclosed with prefabricated hempcrete panels. So this is taking the, uh, the chopped up stalks of the hemp plant and coating them in lime and making prefabricated panels out of this. And you can see here that Quite a few of these buildings are using these ag-based panels um, with mass timber structures. So um, using biogenic materials for the, the, a lot of the structural elements and then some of the, the insulation materials as enclosure products. This is the Gateway Building, University of Nottingham in the UK, uh, another version of prefabricated straw bale panels. Uh, this, this presentation is heavy on these because, you know, this is, the prefab straw bale panels are such a straightforward, simple system. Um, I quickly noticed a, a, a question about fire resistance there. One of the reasons that they've proved so popular is that um, an enclosed straw bale panel uh, gets in, in all the countries it's been tested over a two hour uh, fire rating. So they're able to use them for, uh, for things like public assembly buildings. And the, 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 the flexibility of being able to sort of put straw in a box has made it uh, something that that has been affordable and achievable even on these sort of more prototype buildings. Okay. This is another uh, prefab straw bale building. It's a seven story apartment building. So now we're looking at uh, larger residential examples rather than um, rather than institutional. So the Enterprise Center also in the UK um, here they used a, a combination of thatch panels and interior straw panels with a, uh, with a, a, a mass timber structure system. So you can see that the palette of, of possible materials is quite wide. Um, there are lots of ways to use these plant-based materials. Um, in this case, you know, it's actually the, the, the exterior of the building. It's not, uh, it's not enclosed in a panel where they're using the thatch. Um, so there's, there are lots of examples. There are lots of companies, again, especially in Europe where, where this is being done. Also the interiors of buildings, there are lots of places. Um, there are compressed straw board partitions that make a really great flexible, uh, movable interior wall partition uh, with really great sound and fire ratings. And then there's some things that, you know, we may already be using such as linoleum flooring, which is a plant-based product uh, tectum ceiling and wall panels is a, um, uh, a wood wool product and sort of coming up now lots of hemp straw and sorghum panels. So from uh, flooring options to, uh, to final finishes to sheathing options, um, lots of, of egg waste being used in, in those kind of products as well. This is from a, a study I did about interiors where you, you know, we looked at um, uh, a 3000 square foot single floor office retrofit. And by switching out business as usual materials uh, that, that were planned for this, um, for this retrofit and switching over to their kind of cost competitive carbon storing options, uh, this floor went from emitting 90 kilograms per meter squared to storing 130 kilograms per meter squared on a, on a net basis. So, you know, even when we're looking at redoing buildings uh, there's lots of ways to make sure that we're storing lots of carbon. 
So as a, as a builder myself, um, and I know I'm, I'm talking to a, a company of builders, you know, what, what can you do in, in the role as a contractor? Um, I think, you know, these points here talking, as Bruce said, these conversations uh, and actually making sure that we have them are such a key part of this. Uh, but talking to the designers you work with and the clients you work with about the importance of climate action. If, if you and the company are, are motivated to move on climate action, let your, 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 uh, your colleagues know that, uh, let them know what you're doing, demonstrating your commitment. I know from our, our conversations leading into this presentation um, that Turner's done a, a really interesting study on electrifying uh, the job site and, and those sorts of things really do um, really do demonstrate that you are committed to this and that will carry through to uh, other parts of the building. Talking to your design and structural partners about performance-based rather than prescriptive standards um, as a way to, to try to incorporate uh, low carbon strategies um, while, while being able to work within the, um, the context of codes. Make sure that you're exploring innovative products and approaches. I'm sure for a lot of you, some of those buildings that I just showed in Europe might be the first time you've ever seen that happening. But the fact that that is happening and that other people have been able to do this in other parts of the world. And you know those were highly developed Western European countries that we're talking about. So they have high standards for structural you know, ratings, fire ratings, all of those sorts of things. So you know, understanding what's out there and then starting to you know, ask about how you can do that here. Um, I'm really glad we're sort of doing this next one, educating your team members um, on these new materials and on you know, what the carbon accounting means, how life cycle assessment works, how EPDs work, uh, actually requesting environmental product declarations where this data comes from, from all your suppliers is really helpful. Right now we have a, a sort of self-selected number of manufacturers who offer these, but you know, pressure from you as their buyers uh, will push more companies to make EPDs, which will make all of our jobs easier in being able to make low carbon choices. Uh, I know that, that Turner, you're, you're sort of assisting with and involved in using uh, the EC3 tool for procurement, and they use those EPDs to, to sort of feed you that information. And then to explore carbon credits for offsetting any cost increases that might come from using these materials uh, as early adopters. And you could explore what Aureus Earth is starting to offer in terms of uh, being able to pay building owners for storing carbon in their buildings. They're one of a, a number of startups that are, that are starting to, to look at that. So I think you know, there's a lot that, that we can do in this role as builders and contractors to really influence the ability to make more buildings uh, low carbon and, and ideally carbon storing. And I'm just gonna wrap up with a, with a quick example of how that worked in our own practice. So we were contacted by Trent University here in Ontario. Um, they were about to build a new classroom and we were able to use um, our tool, which is called Beam, uh, to look at the, the carbon footprint of the way that they were going to build the building. And that's there on the left. So their 4,500 square foot classroom building was gonna have over 200 tons of emissions associated with making the materials. And by sitting down with them, working with the tool, looking at all the material options for the exact same cost, we were able to make them a building uh, that stored over six tons of carbon. Um, so, you know, in that one project, there was 215, 220 tons of carbon uh, averted and the final tally being that there was more stored in the building than was emitted. So, um, you know, if we, can, if we can talk to clients early, if we can be part of the design team, uh, we can really influence these decisions in a, you know, in a very massive way. And that's just a look at that building. And one of the things that we did to, uh, to achieve that carbon storage was we used a, a really innovative new uh, precast hempcrete block system that you can see uh, being installed there on the left where um, it's both structural and insulation in, uh, in one product. And that was uh, at least one good part of the, the carbon storing strategy for, for that building. And now back to Bruce. Thank you. 
Uh, I think we're running a little bit behind, so I'm gonna blow through the last few slides here. This is, um, you, you, for those of you who are bewildered by all the acronyms you're seeing, um, this is sort of how things work. If, if we, we're gonna have to be, figure out how to account for carbon as it flows through buildings and, and the ecosystem, industrial ecosystem more generally. And the way we do that is with product category rules, you define the parameters under which you're gonna measure something. If, if I pour concrete for a power plant, is that attributed to the built environment or to the energy industry? You have to decide stuff like that. That leads to a life cycle analysis and that leads to an EPD. That's the basics. It's still in the Wild West phase right now because we're still getting all of our databases organized. Um, we would have different systems for doing life cycle analysis. It's quite a bewildering scene, and which does not mean that it's useless or futile or to be discarded. We're just figuring it out as we go, laying the track as, as we go. Uh, we don't have precision yet, but we definitely have accuracy. We know where the carbon is and how to reduce it. I think you already know about EC3. Great innovation that's come on the market. Can't recommend it highly enough. More broadly, we need to put a price on carbon. If not an outright task uh, tax, then one way or another. And again, it can't be emphasized enough. Just talk to people. Talk to everybody in the ecosystem above you and below you, wherever you are, as a as a citizen or as an employee of Turner. Talk to people. Get people aware of the carbon effects of what we do and the stuff that we use. I talk to everybody, everybody, except my teenage daughter. I don't talk to my teenage daughter. We need to draw it down. Next 20 or 30 years are crucial, make or break time. How might we do that? Well, the thing you hear most often is people talking about uh, net zero by 50. You hear countries claim that for a goal. You hear companies do so, cities, states, towns, all sorts of people say, we're gonna reach net zero by 2050. Sounds good. Oftentimes they're just kicking the can down the road. If they really looked at it, they'd realize they gotta get at it right now to get there. The built environment accounts for something like 21 gigatons out of the 51 that humanity emits every year. So that's a big project right there, getting 21 down to zero. The embodied emissions that Chris and I have been talking about, we're starting at around six, 40% of the total. And we think we can get here to where we are absorbing 15 gigatons of carbon per year by 2050. And in fact, that's what we have to do. Everybody's got to pull on the oars. We've put about a trillion tons of carbon into the air since the industrial revolution started. We got to get at least a good chunk of that out. And we in the built environment have our role to play. For you as a human being, as an employee of Turner, as a member of any kind of organization, sure, reduce your carbon footprint in every way you can. Eat less meat, I don't know, recycle newspapers, etc. That's all good. But don't freak out about it. Way more important is to increase your green handprint, the good stuff you do, the education you do for people, the changes in the corporate culture that you might be able to affect. What can you do that's for the positive that's going to help the climate? Just make sure your green handprint is bigger than your gray footprint and you got it. That's my last book. Chris helped me write four years ago. All of this stuff is in there. Almost all of this stuff is in there and we're working on another one that'll be out in a year, Build Beyond Zero. But there we are. I hope we've ended on time. Great. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, this was many of the folks on this call's first exposure to embodied carbon. So for those of you joining, I hope you enjoyed it and it sparked some interest. We did have a lot of questions come through in the chat. So um, I'll go ahead and get started on those. Um, there's a lot of interest in the biogenic storing, uh, carbon storing blocks. Um, one of those questions was surrounding um, the lifespan of those blocks, what you might expect to see for the, for the durability of that, um, and also the strength of it and how it compares to traditional CMU blocks. So I think, um, Chris, that might be best suited for you. Sure. Um, if we're talking about those, those precast hempcrete blocks, um, they're, they're a really interesting system. Um, there's actually a, um, a plastic frame that the block is cast around 
And that plastic frame is also made from, uh, from hemp resin. So they're kind of using the hemp plant in two different ways there. Um, I'm not a structural engineer, so I don't know, I don't know the exact figures, um, but the, uh, our structural engineer for that project, uh, he's now working with them on a six story building in Vancouver, British Columbia, where the, the seismic loads are pretty heavy. So you'd want to explore with the company and with an engineer more about it, but um, I know that it does have uh, a really surprising uh, amount of structural strength uh, to that system. And in terms of life expectancy, hempcrete in particular is a, an interesting way to use plant material because you, you coat each little piece of plant material in, uh, in limestone. And so you've kind of uh, encapsulated it in a very thin coating of, of rock, basically, which gives it uh, an incredibly high uh, fire rating. Um, but also gives it a, a really great ability to uh, deal with moisture and, and humidity issues. And, you know, all, uh, with the plant-based materials in general, I noticed quickly scanning through the questions that, you know, there was a lot of questions about, about durability, about moisture and things like that. And, you know, one thing to remember is that, is that there are uh, and have been really long lasting examples of plant material being used uh, in buildings. Um, if you look at older buildings in some of our North American cities that were um, built with, with wooden structural frames that are still there and quite often when those buildings get taken down that wood gets reused again. So we know that that has a long lifespan, um, but there are building science issues and mostly these systems rely on uh, being a, a vapor open wall system, which has a, a lot of actual uh, advantages in terms of resiliency because as humidity levels rise in the material, these biogenic materials can, can take on a huge amount of moisture without having it turn into liquid water and then let it go again. So if we keep these, uh, these systems uh, vapor permeable in both directions, uh, they actually turn out to be incredibly resilient uh, in all kinds of, of different humidity scenarios and, and over really long periods of time. Thank you for that. Um, there was a question about the maybe unintended um, downstream effects of, of using biogenic material, whether it has to do with, um, you know, harvesting uh, carbon emissions or maybe uh, the decomposition of biogenic material that if there's any unintended consequences of using it. Well, I think, you know, we do want to be really, really conscientious of that. And I think it's, it's hard to lump all biogenic materials in together in that, you know, there are very different considerations when you're thinking about wood and forest products, where we're kind of taking an ecosystem that is a carbon sink on its own. And, you know, if we're pulling carbon out of that carbon sink and then putting it somewhere else, we may not actually be doing much for the climate. So if we want to think of wood as a meaningful climate, um, approach in building, we have to make sure that the forests are getting bigger or storing more carbon as we take our carbon out. Because if we're just depleting one carbon sink to move it over to buildings, we're not accomplishing much. I think the thing, the reason that I'm so excited by agricultural residues is that we're already making this material. You know, we, we, we eat food, we, we, we plant this stuff, we grow this stuff, um, certainly there are things about our current agriculture system that do have negative effects, but the fact that we would take the residue from that and put it in a building, it doesn't amplify those effects. It doesn't, you know, make them worse. It doesn't change them. It would be great if, you know, as part of the whole climate change program, agriculture, and I believe it is, you know, starting to reform itself to do a better job on those impacts, but by sort of picking up what's left over from food production, we're not causing more land to be, you know, changed. We're not, we're not sort of driving any new uh, emissions or new impacts. We're basically just benefiting from the fact that there's a vast amount of leftover, you know, carbonous fiber uh, when, when, these, when these materials are, are harvested. I would add to that, by the way, that um, this question comes up, what about end of life? What, you know, what about those straw products? Aren't they gonna end up rotting? or burning, and uh, sooner or later, probably yes. But that's what they're gonna do now in this year for this harvest, because that's what we do with them is we burn them or we rot them. Um, 
So we're putting off those emissions. If, if only because we're putting off for a few decades those emissions, it's still worth it. Um, and any of you who've been in this business for more than a few years know that you can build a really crappy building out of really great materials. And likewise, you can build a really pretty good building out of not very good materials. It's all a question of the quality of design and construction, whole realm in itself. And people screw up all the time and that's construction. It's that's construction, but you can certainly build with, um, cellulose materials with biological materials durably for the long run. It's not, I mean, we already have all the experience with wood. We already know a lot about it because of building with wood for centuries. So not an issue. What else you got? What other questions we got? Um, you know, I think the sentiment of a lot of people on this call, we're a national corporation. We go internationally as well. Um, is, is this is all fine and good for Marin County, but you know there's a lot of concerns about biogenic material um, and and how building code officials and how fire inspectors are going to receive seeing um, perceivably burnable material be put into buildings. So um, in response to those jurisdictions, what do you suggest we as contractors can do to assuage the fear um, in those officials or change the change the pace of the conversation? Two words, Grenfell Towers. Anybody remember Grenfell Towers? Four years ago, big fire on a high rise residential building outside of London. And no, it was not made out of straw or bamboo or wood. It was made out of modern industrial materials that everybody thought was so great and safe. And the fire was fit, it was bad design. They created an air chamber that uh, just let the fire spread all over the building very quickly. So it was a really stupid design when they retrofitted the facade of the building. But they used petrochemical foam insulation. And I think on one side it was polyisocyanurate and the other side was polyurethane. So they'd insulated it and that was great. It's better energy efficiency. But those things burn. They burn like crazy and they killed a bunch of people. So everybody thinks like, oh, straw, it's gonna, it's gonna, what if it burns? Lots of stuff burns, including all those petrochemical products that we use all the time. Furthermore, uh, having been working with straw bale buildings for a long time, that's how Chris and I met with this, the straw bale building revival in North America from 30 years ago, a bunch of very fun people and leading now to all these products and things that are something meaningful to a Turner construction. You're not going to build straw bale houses in Turner construction probably, but you might, you'll be using straw products sooner or later. They don't burn. If you've ever been around a fireplace and you try just taking a phone book and throwing it in the fireplace and you, all, you don't even have to look, try, you know what it's gonna happen. It's gonna char on the outside and that's it. Nothing else happens because there's not enough oxygen to get out the fuel to get the whole thing going. It's the dynamics of a fire. The straw bale houses in the wine country here in California survived the wildfires. The wood frame houses did not. Straw is so pack densely packed and you just keep it densely packed like in the straw panel systems Chris showed you, it's much better than wood in a fire. Counterintuitive yeah, maybe, think, but. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously, you know, here in, the, in North America, there has been lots of sort of uh, ASTM quality fire testing done and those other places where those straw products are being used in the building that I showed in Europe, similarly, those, those testing uh, documents exist. So, you know, whether it's a system that, that has approval in a particular jurisdiction you're trying to build in right now is, you know, it, there's a good chance there isn't, but the, the, the testing, the documentation and, and the sort of like known ability of these products to meet all of those code thresholds, it's already been done. You know, the, the Germans don't build fire trap buildings and yet they're building wood fiber wrap buildings, they're building prefabricated straw bale buildings, it's, you know, same with the Brits, same with the French, you know, they, they have, you know, standards that are, you know, similarly high to, uh, to the ones we have in North America and, and these systems have all shown themselves and, you know, some of those buildings I, sh I showed you are, are getting on to a decade or more old now, so, you know, any of the the like, oh, this stuff's going to rot or burn tomorrow kind of questions, they're already settled. You know, they're, those buildings are, are functioning uh, totally fine in those types of climates uh, right now. So I think, you know, as designers, as builders, as material manufacturers, we're, we figured out how to take 
you know, petrochemical foam, which is a fire accelerator and treat it in a way that it, we, we feel confident using it in buildings and we're similarly smart enough. And it's, it's actually a, a lighter lift to figure out how to make sure that, that these products work uh, as intended uh, as it is with, uh, with the ones we're, we're used to now. Great, thank you. Um, we have a great question and we, we're starting to run low on time, so we might make this our last question, but um, this was specifically about um, the use of wood-based material in areas where rainfall is, is higher or if there's more um, relative humidity. Really the same answer as, as for straw or any, any other cellulose material. Give it the right conditions and wood will rot and it'll, or it'll burn. Give it the right conditions and it won't. Japanese have pagodas that have been there for centuries and they're made out of wood. So that just comes back to good design, good building science and understanding shed water away from your building and, and all of that. Um, and yes, wood will rot and concrete won't. Yeah, but concrete will do a lot of other things that you don't like either and so will steel. There's no perfect building material. Nature's gonna get us sooner or later. We're just fighting a holding matter to, battle to keep ourselves <laughs> sheltered. <laughs> but we can work with nature and build with cellulosic materials and it'll last for a very long time, decades, centuries. I don't, I don't mean to be so blithe, but we are running out of time and everything. But believe me, we thought a lot about water. We thought a lot about fire structure and everything. And um, we just keep liking the more evidence comes in, the more study we have, the more testing that gets done all over the world, the more we feel like, wow, this stuff's great. We had the reservations too. Chris and I did, and all of our friends did. Said, well, isn't it going to rot? Isn't it going to burn? Sure, it will. Give it the right conditions, just like the building you're in will. Well, I think it's time to wrap it up. Thank you again so much for joining us today, Chris and Bruce. This is a fantastic webinar. Again, a great introduction for a lot of the folks on this call. Um, if you are on this call, just know again that the recording will be made available on TKN if you'd like to revisit any of the content. Um, I'd also like to use this opportunity to let you know that we will be having another webinar on this topic next month um, just to continue the conversation of what contractors can do about embodied carbon. So we really hope you enjoyed today's presentation um, and uh, look forward to future conversations on the topic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. Yeah, thanks Thank very you. much.